are in James, the second chapter, verse 13 today. We're just flying through the book of James like a turtle. Let me get to James 2.13. In the second half, Gary Horton will bring us a report from Kentucky to let you know things are still really healthy out there among young people. He just came off a great evangelistic tour uh, of uh, over 11,000 kids. And uh, he'll bring you a stirring, healthy report about the youth of America. I think that will encourage your heart. But here we are in verse 13 today, James 2.13. We've been in a study. If you have a study Bible, you'll know that we're talking verses 1 through 13. Notice if you have a study Bible, for example, mine shows you that there, this is what we call context, verses 1 through 13. And if you have a study Bible, they're going to call it something like, like mine does here, New American Standard is going to call it the sin of partiality. I don't know what, how yours identified it. But uh, it should be in that ball, ball game, prejudiced of some sort. And, uh, and so th we've been a, in a discussion through this whole thing as James is trying to explain to us there ought to be unity and harmony. We are all one in Christ in the church. That would be wonderful if we could really get that, wouldn't it? We're all one. We're Gal Galatians 7 at Galatians, the third chapter, 27, 28. Uh, he reminds us that we're one in Christ in the church. We're, we're no longer Jew and Gentile. We're no longer male and female. We're no longer free and slave. We're no longer yada, yada. We're one in Christ, he says. And so whatever kind of, what, what, whatever kind of uh, social or cultural mores we might have as we come to Christ, We've got to learn to lay them aside. And we worked really hard here to try to do that. We don't try to, um, you know, our school of biblical theology, we take, we take every person in there who has a desire to learn, that wants to learn how to develop ministries in their life. Um, every person that comes in, we give them one, uh, an A. And the only way you can flunk the course is not show up. Because the Bible says, run the race to the finish. If you finish the course, you get an A. That's grace. We try to teach grace in the practical aspects. Because we believe that we're one in Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that brings the great ministry to our life. It has nothing to do with education. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with these, these things that we put on ourselves uh, and separate us into groups. The church is to be one in Christ. And so James has been pounding that, and he has been talking about the sin of partiality, and he says in verse 8 that the, the violation, that the law that's been violated in the sin of partiality or prejudice or bias, hmm, is that it violates the law, the royal law of love, and he quotes Leviticus 19.18. Now, on your paper, be sure it's not 1819. Always pay attention to my numbers, <laughs> you know, because sometimes I, I put them backwards. What should it, be? it should be 1918. Yeah, I have 1819 somewhere. We always watch my numbers because sometimes I flip those babies. It's not intentional. That's why we're one in Christ. We're not this or that. All right? So always pay attention to my numbers. Um, so what he, he said, what the sin of partiality does, now, you know, it, it also develops out of that whole thing that, because it's sin, it develops carnality in the Christian life. Can't do anything in carnality. But James is trying to explain to us what the sin of partiality, and it, it, what they were doing is, they had their prejudice on certain kinds of people. The rich people, they would put the people they thought could help them in their, in their personal life and in the life of their church. They would give them special places because they thought these people would be, be beneficial. They missed the story that Jesus gave, told them about people bringing offerings and the one that he loved the most, the offering that he loved the most was the widow who brought the, 
might, you know, a penny, not even a penny. <laughs> I mean, the lowest numerical uh, in economics, in, in money. And so, and so they were making, they were, and of course they were being persecuted. And so people that came in, they thought could help them. And so he comes back in this passage, in this great context of passage and says, why would you go back to those who, who, who do you wrong? And by the way, this, this is what we've been studying on Tuesday and Wednesday out of the book of Hebrews. James and Hebrews, these, the, the, he, they're both writing to the same group of people who have come from the Jewish faith through Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, where he dies for our sins, buried and raised from the dead on the third day. These people have come to Christ, and because of persecution by their people, they have left the church assembly and gone back to the Jewish assembly. And both writers are warning them. The book of Hebrews really gets after it. And we've been studying that. Well, anyhow, James is warning these believers not to leave the new covenant faith, the grace faith system, to go back to the old covenant system of law works. Do not do that. One of the most disappointing things in my ministry has been to watch people come into the word of God, understand the importance of the freedom the word of God. He who knows the truth gets set free from the lies of the systems that work out there. To go back to a legalistic church. I mean, you couldn't put yourself in a worse position in the whole wide world to do that. You must never do that. You must never do it. And listen, you don't have to do it. We'll be in your periphery somewhere. Uh, uh, there will be a doctrinal church in this periphery as long as I have breath in my body. It'll be somewhere in the greater Birmingham area. Uh, we, we are soon to move from here to Moody. W nothing will change except the location. Here she comes. Must be no babies. I only get her if there's no babies. Then she steps down a notch and comes to me. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our morning study. Father, we're so thankful today. Al covered our, we need to confess our sins. But Father, we can't study the Bible and we can't apply it in carnality. Can't do it. And so we thank you for the principle from the extension of the propitious work of Christ on the cross as extended to us in the cleansing apparatus, not for redemption, but for reconciliation. Uh, and that by mean restoration. And so we're thankful for that. We're thankful that we can confess our sin anytime, any place, any day. You will hear it and respond to it as a, as a point of obedience on our part and be restored to the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the, oh, I don't know, the engine that runs the whole thing, Father, in my mind. I'm thankful for that. And so I pray as our people uh, do that within their own priesthood, both on those who are in our congregation and those on the Internet, please do that. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that's homo legio. If we confess our sins, name it, cite it, come into an agreement with God on the sin we have in our life based on what the word of God calls sin. And we confess it. He is just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And by that, restore us to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that gives us not only the ability to learn, but to recall and apply. That's a pretty amazing system, Father, and it operates by grace and not by works. And, and I'm so thankful for that. I pray, Father, today the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this word of God. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Wow. What a principle that is. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what James, his, here's his summary, verse 13. It's his summary of this whole discussion. We've, I don't know how many lessons we've had on this. We had a lot uh, in 13 verses. 
And James now makes a summary about this whole thing. Here's what he says in verse 13. For judgment will be merciless to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy, and here's my message, triumphs over judgment. Triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's such a wonderful grace concept. I can't, I can't begin to tell you what a wonderful concept that is. Just think about this. Mercy is because a person deserves judgment. When mercy comes into a place, justice has brought them to judgment. And the only way out from under that, justice has brought you to judgment. You deserved it. When you get to judgment, you've been fairly heard and fairly exercised, and there you are at judgment. Mercy steps in and says, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of the judgment. And listen, not only will I take care of the judgment, listen, when God does it, I'll do it by grace. I'll do it by grace. Think about that. Grace requires, the judgment requires that something be, be done about it. Mercy comes along and says, I'll take care of it. And the only way that can take care of it is somebody else has to, has to pay for that for you. The judgment that was on you, mercy says, I'll put it over here. Somebody else paid your debt. You got out of, you got out of jail. You've played Monopoly. It's been a long time ago, but you played it. Winter seasons are coming up. You play Monopoly, right? All those games you, you put aside in the summer, you bring them back out in the winter, right? We do it at our house. Well, anyhow, I want to talk about three things about this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The first thing is the Greek word. I got to tell you this Greek word because it's pretty interesting. See, see kata on the front of it? See kata? That's a preposition. When you add a preposition to a verb or a noun, it hypes up its meaning. It elevates the meaning of the word. When you put kata on the front, it intensifies it because ka, ka, kata is a word against. It, 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 any, any preposition intensifies it. It revs it up. It pushes it into a, a different idea off the main word. Now, the main word here is boast. The main word, which, which notice K-A-U-C-H-A-O-M-A-I, M-A-I. Notice this word. That word means boast, rejoice, glory. That's what that means. That's what that word means. But when you put kata on it, it revs it up and pushes it a different way. That's like, you know, you have three gears forward and one backwards. This is kata would be that backward gear. It's a different gear. It's a different, it's a different slant to it. So, and kata means against. This, th they translate this over or against. A literal translation of this word, a literal translation uh, uh, means, for example, maybe your Bible, maybe you have a King James or maybe you have a, a New American Standard, something like that. They might say mercy rejoices against judgment or, or it might say rejoices over, over it. Over would not be a great translation of kata as a preposition. Uh, that would be uh, uh, hu hu hupo or somebody, something like that. But kata... Kata puts it against it. And so what, the, what this actually said, that's okay to say, listen, this word, this word means boast, rejoice, glory. Put kata on it means against. Mercy rejoices, boasts, glories against judgment. Do you understand that? Well, you say, no, I don't. Well, I just explained it a moment ago. 
in order to get to a place of judgment in your life, justice has to, justice has to be involved to bring you to a judgment. And God is more pure with that than any human court. And even that, we believe, until recently, apparently, you know, it is until proven guilty in business, you go through a system of justice, and then it brings you a judgment. And that's a, that's a God standard. Well, when you go through the justice system to get, to get to condemnation or judgment, condemnation or judgment, condemnation is between justice and, and judgment. Come on now. You've been condemned. Now what's, what's, Now we decide how long you're going to stay in prison or whether you're going to die or whatever it is. So you have, you have justice there. Well, when that whole system works down to judgment, it's because somebody deserves the judgment they're getting. So for mercy to come in, mercy comes in and says, look, somebody else has paid the debt of the judgment. So that's the whole salvation picture, isn't it? That's the whole salvation picture. I mean, who did that? Jesus hung on the cross for our sin and judgment. And what did we get? Listen, we, we, we sing amazing grace, and rightly so. And we get saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. But you know, grace does not go until mercy is signed off on. You don't get salvation. When, when you get saved by grace through faith, it's because God signed off on mercy. That's what our song said today. What was that key, what was that key line about mercy there, Richard? Mercy says it's great. Grace That's absolutely it. Sure. It, it if, 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 you're getting, if you're getting, for by grace you're saved through faith, it's because God signed off on mercy. Because you deserve judgment. I deserve judgment. Now, here's what he says. He says, mercy rejoices against judgment. Now, who's going to rejoice? Here's judgment. Who's going to rejoice over mercy? The condemned, those who are condemned, who are under the judgment. Mercy rejoices against judgment. Every person in this room who has been saved by the grace of God and, and that is every person that believes he died as a substitute for us on our behalf, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, has received, you're saved by mercy. Mercy. When you're saved by grace, it's because God has signed off on mercy. He put all the judgment and the justice on him. And who should rejoice against? Mercy rejoices against judgment. Do you not see that? Oh, please tell me. I mean, I love grace more than anything. I think it's the most wonderful concept because the light shines on God. But listen, you don't get it without mercy. The first light that shines of the God is that he gives us mercy. Saved by mercy, grace works freely. It wouldn't work freely if it wasn't for mercy. Mercy triumphs. I love that because it, it's a transliteration of the idea. The English triumphs over is a transliteration of the idea. Somebody sat down like me and said, what does this all mean? And put it out there and goes like, whoa. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's a good, that's a transliteration of a great idea. And so, if you're still struggling a little bit with this concept, let's go to Luke 10. Let's go to Luke 10 for a moment. And this, this can be illustrated by Jesus in a parable of your, a one that you're familiar with, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Now, when you get over to Luke 10, and we get into what? Well, verse, what, 25, somewhere in there. The Good Samaritan, verse 30 in my Bible, verse 30 through 37. 
uh, you're probably familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he tells this parable. I want you to pay attention to two questions that were asked. I put these on your paper. I put the, where, well, we'll look in verse 25. Uh, in verse 25, this whole thing starts in 25. A certain lawyer, that is a scholar of the law, that's a scholar of the law, uh, that's, a, that's a theological scholar of the Mosaic law. Uh, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what's the question? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? There's a discussion goes on, and then we drop down to verse 29. He asked a second question. He said, but wishing to justify himself by the response that Jesus gave him to the first question, wishing to justify himself, in other words, try to, try to get his position better understood, trying to get Jesus to understand his position better, uh, what he was really after and, 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 and asking about the first question, trying to justify his first question, trying to clear up to make Jesus, make sure Jesus understood what I'm really asking. I don't know that you answered. So do you see the two questions? So let's take a look at what Jesus said. He asked a question. Let's look at what Jesus said to him that sparked a second question. All right, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, what? And boy, he was on the money. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. You know where that comes from? Deuteronomy 6, 5. That's the Shema. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. There is but one God. And then he lays that, he lays that whole thing out. Sixth chapter, verse 5. That's what he just quoted. Then he quotes Leviticus 19, 18. Love your, with this love of God, with this love of God in your heart, in your soul, in your strength, in your mind, or your whole being, right? There's not much left there other than your breath. And with this love, carry to your neighbor. Love your neighbor as what? Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. This is a person that has found the love of God and is in love with God because of what God's love does for him, what love God has done for him. He's engaged with that love of God. I'm content in who I am in God because of his love that I've had experience with, and I love his love. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't love love? Now, that's the real deal. The rest of the stuff in life, who knows, right? <laughs> but we know this one, the real deal. And once we come to understand that, embrace the love of God, not that God loves me, but I love God for the way he loves me. See, there's a difference. Please tell me, you know, there's a difference what I just <laughs> Okay. Then that is the love we take to our neighbor. That's the love we take to our neighbor. A love that loves them without any benefit back. Come on now. See, when we fall in love with God because we know it's a t it, it, that he loves me, Right? Unconditionally. He's going to love me. He's going to love me. It don't matter what. Because this love has made us one. We are one. And I know that God will always love me no matter what in my life. Be, be, because that love, for listen to me, because that love goes through Christ or it doesn't come. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Would that answer his question? Would that verse answer this man's question, what must I do to inherit life? Jesus said, well, what's the, what's the Bible say? And he, he, he said it exactly. 
except he missed. He missed this. The love of God only flows through Jesus Christ to us. For God so loved the world, he's in the world. For God so loved the world, right, that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have, ever, and have everlasting life. There's the answer to it. See, the person that has loved God in this way is now able to bring it unconditionally to other people. Even when they bite your hand when you feed them. They stomp on your foot when you take, take, take good things to them. This is a love that you bring to others because you're healthy in your side. You're not looking for something back. God ain't look, when, he, when God loves you through Christ, he's not looking for anything back. He knows God. Now, this love is only as good as... <laughs> It's only as good as his character. It's not based on your character. He loved you. He loved you when you, you had nothing to give him. You were dead in sin and trespasses. And he loves you in that state. You'll never be in that state once you believe the gospel of Christ. And so you come to understand this love that God has for me, that I love, God will always love me. God will always love me with the same way he loved me the moment he saved me. He will always love me with that. It's up to me to grow to understand what that great love means. When you grow, when you grow in the knowledge of God, then you grow in his love. Your, your capacity for that love, your capacity for it. And at some point, you want to share that love with other people. That's a natural flow. Otherwise, you're the Dead Sea. Everything flows in, nothing flows out. That's a Dead Sea. That shows you that you don't understand. You do not understand what has been flowed to you because it's not flowing out of you. And it should flow from you even when you know in your own heart and in your own flesh you can the way they have treated me, I can't love them. I can't do it. I can't do it, Ron. I cannot do it. I know. Listen, I've heard that. But listen, even if you knew you could do it, you shouldn't do it the way you're thinking because you think you have to do it in the flesh. You have to do it in the spirit. The fruit of the spirit, what's the first one? Love. That's the what love we're talking about. We're talking about agape. The love. See, it's supernatural. Even if you... Even if you're in a good place in your soul and you think that I could give that to them freely, if it's not done in the spirit, it's still done in the flesh, right? How do you know the difference? Well, you know it upstairs, right here in your head. Well, I'm doing this because I like them. Well, how about doing it for those you don't like? Do the, can you do the same thing with the same attitude, with the same joyfulness? Can you do that? You can in the spirit, but you can't in the flesh. So he's not asking us to do something that's impossible. He's asking us to do something very possible with God, even when it's impossible with man, right? That's very important. So here we are back in this parable. We are back in this parable, and the, par and the man answered good. And here's what Jesus said. You've answered correctly. Da -da 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 -da. You've won the jackpot. Da -da -da. You've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. You're on the right track, son. Verse 29, he comes to a second question. Wishing to justify his position... Theologically, so we know he missed the first deal. He, he, he had the right answer, but he couldn't apply it to his life. He was a learner and not a liver. That didn't come out right. I went from a heart to a liver. I don't know how did that happen. Well, anyhow, see, I just, I'm living proof that anybody can do this. I'm living proof. He says, wishing to justify his position, then who is my neighbor? That leads to the parable. So he gives this parable. You're familiar with the parable. There's a man 
that's a businessman going from Jerusalem, apparently a Jew, going from Jerusalem to Jericho for business. And apparently on the other side is a man going from Jericho to Jerusalem to do business. One's a Jew and one's a Samaritan. This, the, the Jew on his way to Jerusalem, because they're in the fourth cycle of divine discipline in their nation, Israel, there's a lot of crime. If you study the five cycles of divine discipline, crime has multiplied seven times in the nation of Israel. This was commonplace. This was everyday news. I mean, think about this. Think about, um, th think about America, but listen, think about Birmingham. We've become, we've become callous to the idea that there's three or four, five, six, ten murders a day. A day. Something wrong with that picture. In the Bible Belt, that's, that's a tough picture to swallow. It shows a, a decadent society. When you kill your own, you're close to eating them. You kill your own. Uh, this is, here's what we say. This is inhumane. You have no idea how close you are to losing your humanity when you, when you get in that mind state. But, so here they are. They're, one is left home uh, from Jericho, headed to Jerusalem as a business trip. One is leaving from Jerusalem headed on a business trip to Jericho and somewhere in the middle the guy the Jewish boy a man businessman is robbed beaten left naked all of his clothes taken all of his money and left the Bible says half dead I find half dead kind of an interesting idea now, I don't know who, what medical team came up with that idea. Half dead. That's kind of like a half glass. You know, is it half full or half empty? Half dead sounds like an empty to me. He's half dead. Now, I think that's important because there was a chance he could live if somebody would stop and help him. I like that idea. So along comes a priest, a Jewish priest, sees a Jewish man half dead. Meaning that if he got aid, he could probably live. Just put a tourniquet on him, he'll, we'll get, we'll, he'll be all right. We'll get him someplace. He's beat up bad. He's half dead. They walk by, they see him half dead. If we stopped and took care of him, he would live. Listen what they did. The priest walked all, went all the way around the other side not to contaminate himself from the law. Another man comes by. He's a Levi. We got the two top religious people in the nation of Israel that represent the law of God. Levi comes along takes a look at the Jewish man, sees him half dead, knowing that half dead, this man could survive if somebody would stop and help him, passes by like the first man on the other side to be sure he wasn't contaminated in the law. Both of them leave him half dead on the side of a road like a dog or a cat. Even humane, listen to me now, even humane people could not stand for a dog or a cat to be half dead. Right? We're going to stop traffic. And somebody's going to say, well, it's just a dog. Hey, it's my dog then, <laughs> right? I see that as my dog. It's not just a dog. That's my dog. And we call that humane. Th 
th we're talking about a human being with human beings. And they treat him like a dog or a cat who's been run over. They treat him more like a possum. I, mean, I don't know if any of it stopped for a possum. I mean, who has a pet possum? So it's kind of interesting how we, did, how, we, how we figure this stuff out in our heads. But it's not hard to figure that it's human and we're part of the human race. And so they leave him to die. They leave him another human being, a Jew who is one of their people, one of their religion, leave him die. Along comes a Samaritan, and the Bible says he looks at the man and feels compassion. You know, you know what? The, this word, I'm going to use this. It's probably on your paper. This word, compassion, you know what compa the word that's used here is a word in the Greek language that means the application of mercy. Compassion is the application of mercy. You know what this man does? He shows him mercy. And what led him to do it? Now, he's a Samaritan. He's not a Jew. He's not of the Jewish faith. He's a human being made in the image of God. He understands in his religion that all people are made in the image of God according to his likeness. And the man who's in his Bible understands that man is made in the image according to the likeness of God. That's Samaritan because of the compassion of what he understands about humanity made in the image according to the likeness of God. That Samaritan with his Bible stops and shows compassion. Compassion is the application of mercy. He's a first responder mindset guy. He's a first responder. And stops. He didn't pass him by. He's a first responder. We got two that weren't. Not because their Bible says they shouldn't be compassionate. The Bible says you ought to love God in such a way that you can love others without concern for yourself and what you might feel or how I might be treated with this. If I step out and extend my love to that person and they bite my hand, then what am I going to do? You're going to extend it and extend it because that's what love is about. It's about giving it away, not giving it away to get it back. It's giving it away to never get it back. It doesn't matter how many times they bite your hand, you see, keep feeding them. We say that's stupid. No, it ain't. That's compassion. Listen, mercy will never work in application without compassion. Compassion is driven by God's love. Love is what drives mercy. Mercy drives grace. And what you see is the flip side. This guy comes along for his love for humanity because he's, this is a fellow human being made in the image of God. His Bible says made in the image of God. That Samaritan Bible says the same thing the Jewish Bible says, made in the image of God according to the likeness of man, uh, the likeness of God. And he shows compassion, compassion, Mercy in application Mer is called mercy in action, a first responder attitude. First thing he does is treat him on the spot. He does the very best he can to stop his bleeding and to do the things that are necessary to what? Stabilize him. He's half dead and he stabilizes him, puts, gets him mobile, puts him on his donkey and takes him to the first end, treats him again with help, gets him stabilized so that he's working on the second half. He's, not, he's no longer dying. He's no longer half dead. He's half alive. See the attitude change? 
He stabilized him to get out of half dead to get him into half alive. There's a whole different. He, 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 he's no longer critical. He's no longer critical. You know how important those words are at a hospital? Your husband, your daughter, your child, your mate, whatever, is no longer critical. He's now been moved to another support system, and things are, oh, oh, oh we're, we're looking good. That's exactly. This first responder stabilized him, took him to a second holding place to get him stable, to get him back into living. He's no longer half dead. He's half alive. He pays the second respond team. He helps. He pays them to take care of him till he can get his business done since he's now recovering. No longer half dead. He's half alive and recovering because this man... Out of his humanity of a biblical principle that all man, all mankind is made in the image according to the likeness of God, had the compassion of another for another human being. He put mercy into action and stabilized him, put him into a second u- u- unit of stabilization, went off to finish his business and came back to check on him. Why'd you do that? We would ask him, why'd you do that? Here'd be his answer. I, I couldn't do anything else, but I, I couldn't do anything. Well, we, you were late to your business deal. How'd it go? <laughs> the man, when he understood, he would, and, and listen, I got more business than I would normally get because the man was impressed. I wasn't, but I just did what I had to do. But he was impressed. I was late for my business deal. I told him why I was late. And he went, wow. And he gave me more business than normally do. He said, listen, I'm so appreciative of that. If I'd have been that man, I would like to have been, what a wonderful Samaritan you are. Look, I, I've got two or three businesses I want you to talk to. I'm going to give you more Jewish business. Well, you don't have to do that. I didn't do that for my business. I know that. I like to meet a man that, that actually is, understands the, the whole deal. I, I added that last part to this. That's how I would have felt. I would have thought, boy, if that was me, I'm going to help you get business. You're the kind of man I want to do business with myself and my friends. This is the kind of guy we want to. Listen, a Samaritan that treated you that way, <laughs> you're a breath of fresh air. So we get down to the end of we get down to the end of this Samaritan story. In verse 36, he asked this young man. Jesus asked him a question. And boy, the answer to this is going to be very important because this is the big test. When Jesus asks you a question, it could be a gate question. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Listen to what he said. The one who showed. Mercy. See, he understood the theology of it. It never, the Bible, the story of the parable never said that the the Samaritan showed mercy. It said he saw the need and showed compassion. The application of mercy. But this young man saw the application. He saw the theology behind it. He didn't say, well, the man who showed compassion. He didn't say that. He used the word mercy. He said, the one who showed mercy towards him, Jesus said, gave him two commands. These are imperatives. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I'm kind of surprised that Jesus didn't say to him what he normally says to somebody like this. Come and follow me. (laughs) 
the guy in this story that he'd have probably said that to would have been the Samaritan. Like he did the woman at the well and all of her friends. Who are we today in this story? Who are we? I used to ask teenagers that and college kids when I would teach them, and I would teach this story. Who do you want to be in this? Nobody wanted to be the man who got robbed and beat up and left half dead. <laughs> Never had one. I thought for sure I'd have some sadist type of kid in there that go, I'll take that one. I'll take that role. And nobody wanted to be the priest nor the Levi. Nobody wanted to be them. Everybody wanted to be the Samaritan. Isn't that interesting? Never had any. I, I, I spoke to a lot of kids. I always told this story. Sometime during my study with them, they all wanted to be the Samaritan. I was kind of interesting. Nobody wanted to be the Jesus in the story. Nobody wanted to be the Jesus. This was a parable from Jesus. <laughs> but it's such a dramatic story that you get captured by the people in the story, and it's just a story. We forget about the people. Actually, there are only two people. That's Jesus and the lawyer. Never had anybody want to be them. Everybody, everybody got so captivated by this great parable. Everybody got so engaged in the parable that they, they thought them as real people. <laughs> I always find this stuff interesting. And so, Vines, in his little book, uh, Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words, he talks about this out of this parable. He said, if you can understand this parable, you can understand how mercy works. And here's what he says about it. He says, mercy, God's mercy, assumes a need on the part of him who receives it, Stay with the story in the parable now. You got that picture? Stay, stay with it. Stay with it. It assumes a need on the part of he who receives it and the resources adequate to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. Isn't that interesting? He said, there is how mercy works. There is mercy. And this parable is, is lights out on it. Lights out on it. Jesus talked about it in Luke, the sixth chapter, thir verse 36. He said, he said, be merciful to others just as. See, we're to love others just as God loved us. We're to forgive others just as God forgave us. We're to be merciful to others just as God is merciful to us. That list goes, that's a pretty long list. He says, be merciful to others just as your father is merciful and he uses the word compassion. That's the word that's used with the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. Be merciful to others just as your father is merciful, is compassionate for the misfortune of you. You have that for others. Notice that? This is used, this same word compassion is used in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to close with this because my time is up. I knew I wasn't going to get through it all anyhow. Seems to be my MOS. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The compassion towards the, li the littlest of needs in your life. Or we might say all of your needs in your life. But somehow when I say compassionate about, merciful to all your needs in your life, you, th you, you think they're for only the big ones and not the little ones, and he means all of them. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You know how all of that works? For you to understand how mercy works in your life and flows out of you with compassion towards others who need to be 
have mercy exercised on their life, who need mercy. Let me tell you, the people who need mercy that get it, it changes their life. Do you think that that man, that Jewish man, that that Samaritan helped and got him back on his feet, got him back with his family, got him back in society, do you not think that that man felt a debt of gratitude to that Samaritan? Do you think that probably his attitude towards that Samaritan was changed forever? Can you not see him make a business trip up there to tell him, his wife and his children, what a wonderful man he was to him? Do you not see a healing process of cultures and races and all of that done because of compassion? Oh, I hope we see that today. Oh, I hope we see that today. Because that's all, that's all we're going to see today about it. But we need to see that, don't we? And see, that's part of this. Therefore, he said, therefore, that's your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is that is good, acceptable, and perfect. We will have stories like this in our life if we will do this. We will have stories like this. That's what Jesus is trying to tell the young man. You can have a story like this in your life. You can have many stories like this in your life. This doesn't have to be something parable you read from Jesus. This should be our life. He gave it as a real life experience. I mean, it, when you study this, it gets so real. You think you're in it. You forget about who's outside this parable. It is so real. So, Father, we thank you today. What is our point? Be compassionate towards others in need. We have the resources. If we see the need, we have the resources to bring people who are dead or half dead back to life. What a great story. This story is all about not being half dead by an inhumane society, but being brought back to life by a humane society. How much more the church of Jesus Christ, Father? How much more the church of Jesus Christ? Challenge us this week with this message. Challenge us, Father. Let none of us be spared. This is a wonderful event in the life of these people. Somebody out of in our circles this week is going to need to be touched by unconditional love and mercy and righteousness and justice. And who better than us? We are prepared for that, Father. We are prepared for it. We are prepared for it. In Jesus' name, amen.